To help residents understand what is at risk when it comes to Sutter County levees, in 2009, Sutter County launched the 1955 Flood Project, an effort to videotape and archive eyewitness accounts to the 1955 flood. The following video utilizes some of the new interviews and a series of radio interviews conducted in early 1956 by Dutch Klimp of KUBA. Through the voices of the eyewitnesses, we offer the following story of what can happen and what did happen in this case when a levee fails to hold back the river at flood stage. I got actually mad. I thought, what a mess to get into. <laughs> I mean, that I for one minute had turned my back on that river and let it push me like that. It, uh, it made me mad, and I think that's what saved me. I was just mad enough to get out of there and do something about it. On Christmas Eve 1955, at four minutes past midnight, a levee collapsed just south of Yuba City, and a wall of water a half mile wide and 21 feet high spilled into Sutter County. And he said, tell people to get out, get out. It's flooded. We're flooded. We're flooded. Spreading at high velocity in a 180-degree arc, the floodwaters of the Feather River inundated 90% of Yuba City and the farms and ranch houses in the unincorporated areas to the south and southwest. Almost 40,000 evacuated ahead of and sometimes through the roaring water. 600 were plucked off rooftops and trees and cars and telephone poles by helicopters. Hundreds more were rescued by boat. 38 people drowned. We should have stayed at home. I got everybody to leave. And uh, if we'd have stayed at home, they'd have got wet, but they'd have still been alive. That's bothered me all my life. This is a story of that flood. It's being told with the voices of people who lived through it. It's being told at this time because the condition of the levees we rely upon for flood protection is being called into question by engineers who have conducted a series of tests. Efforts are underway to strengthen the levees to keep communities out of the floodplain. Sutter County just may have more levee miles per capita than any other community in the United States. There are 240 miles of levees to protect homes and farmland and businesses from the slow rise of flood threats presented by the Sacramento, Feather, Yuba, and Bear Rivers, and from the Sutter Bypass that cuts through the heart of the county. Owned by the state of California, these levees are the frontline defense system for the community. Built initially in the late 1800s with several additions and improvements over the decades, the levees in most wet seasons provide sufficient protection from rising rivers. But occasionally, as at Meridian in 1903 and 1940, as at Yuba City in 1907 and 1955, and in Meridian again in 1997, the levees have failed with disastrous results. People were spending a lot of time driving over to the levees and looking over, driving across the bridge before the Fifth Street Bridge went out, and concerned, worried, was talking to the town, everybody was talking about it, and uh, the river was so high, both rivers were so high that, that everybody, that's about everybody, everybody was so Home on the 23rd, it was pouring rain here, everybody was talking about the rivers were rising and, uh, you know, Marysville might be in danger. No Oroville Dam at that time. And uh, they said the water was coming down Feather River Canyon, clear up to the, where the highway was on at highway, what is that, 70? Yeah. 
before, or the night it broke, actually, my dad and I thought we'd better go see how the river was doing. And we went down to the end of Wilson Road toward the Feather River and went up on the levee. And we said, gee, we got six to eight feet of freeboard here. Doesn't look bad. Except I'd never heard the Feather River roar like that was roaring. And out in the middle of the river, the waves like this were probably six to eight feet. That the water was going so fast, it was just this churning motion. But we thought it looked pretty good. So we went home, and I went to bed. We all went to bed. It's just really kind of surreal, because I remember it just raining and raining and raining. And um, people were just going about doing their things. And we lived out on a ranch out on Grove Road, which is off of Bogue Road. So to me, that's way, way out in the country as a little child. There's no uh, talk of uh, evacuating Yuba City. Everybody thought it was going to go on Marysville. I was, I had been working uh, part time at the Hotel Marysville uh, as an elevator boy. Uh, my boss called me and asked me to come over. He said, uh, we're going to move uh, one of the hospitals up to the fourth floor. We had it moved up by 10 o'clock that night. So we went up on the roof. First time I'd, uh, I'd been on the roof of it. And uh, Marysville had been evacuated. And I mean, it really looked creepy. You'd see a MP walking way up there on the street, you know. Made me think of those Japanese movies where a big monster comes up <laughs> over the city, you know. 3855 Lincoln Road, the corner of Lincoln and Township. Mom and Dad's house was on the corner and we were the, in the next piece of property, Walnut Orchard, next door. We were sitting up that night listening to the reports and Mom finally chased us to bed and said, go to bed and I'll wake you up if something. The car dealers in Marysville moved all their cars, their new cars, over to the fairgrounds in Yuba City, which ended up totally underwater. And so they were doing a lot of things, uh, evacuating Marysville and everything else, and uh, then Yuba City ends up flooding. This Marysville scene was being broadcast. I think the father, it was rising and there was danger. And, you know, that's it's basically an island and the water was rising and the levees were weak and no one expe expected the Sutter County side. That was pretty obvious by our preparedness. <laughs> there was no evacuation. People in Marysville had been given mandatory evacuation orders and the bridge, we had three lanes coming across this way and the one uh, southerly lane going into Marysville, it kept that open, but only for emergencies or authorized people. I'll never forget as I was out there directing traffic with my arms, and I did that until about five o'clock that night. And uh, I can tell you that was quite an experience. Uh, people wanted to go back to Marysville and we couldn't let them by, and the people coming, it was something to watch their faces. Some of them obviously were emotional, they had Christmas trees in the back and clothes and toys and it's so many people call me obscene words, flip me off with obscene gestures and most of them were good though. It was just one of those things and you had to take a hard stand and so they couldn't go back to their homes and that's what I did until five that night. It was right before Christmas and we were on top of the levee at our farm and the water was really high, I remember that. It had been raining that biblical 40 days and nights. And my father was astounded. Oh, the bucket when the water is high You got to be the right soldier or 
you're gonna die Tables up Oh man, the tables up Tables up rising all this time. It never stopped rising. Uh, the situation over there at uh, Fifth Street Bridge where the bridge comes up, where you come up onto the bridge, uh, the levee uh, in those days that bridge came down through the levee. The levee came down and had a cross-section through there and that was that was uh, the roadway. But they had the uh, wisdom to come out ahead of time two days before the flood happened and plant some heavy timbers and some other you know heavy timber posts and then some heavy timber planks across there and, and assemble it all and start stacking sandbags to try to save to keep the water out from coming through there and uh, I can tell you if there are any heroes in this flood those men were the heroes. Um, they work their hearts out. So I drove the, the crane back and forth. He operated the crane up top. And we would use a clamshell and drop down over the side and pick up logs or whatever debris was in there, swing them over to the other side and release them. In other words, we kept the, the pilings clear. And we pulled refrigerators, logs, all kinds of stuff. Even even on D Street Bridge, on one occasion, we pulled a live pig out. And he run down town Marysville. Where he went, I don't know. But. Uh, the biggest excitement during the day was when the railway bridge at the 5th Street Bridge went out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, almost, I, I say almost because it nearly did, jerked the, the gates out at the, at the 5th Street entrance of the bridge, the railway gates. And uh, we had a few very exciting moments. When the railroad bridge went out, it didn't go all the way down. You could see parts of it over, out of the water. And the rail had never come apart. And uh, they were, the engineers was afraid that it was going to pull this gate out. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the few that could run the torch and I burnt the rails off right over, just reached over the door and burnt them off. And then the railroad bridge went on down the river, tumbled on down the river. Some people were filling bags and we were just taking them, my job was just take them from where they filled them and put them over on where we were stacking them, which was on the water side of the levee. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird to be stacking a sandbag in the water right up to the top of that sandbag. Put another sandbag and pretty soon the water was up to that top of that sandbag. And you know you're standing there and the water is higher than, than the levee you're standing on. All of us were wondering where, when there was going to be an evacuation order given for Yuba City. We all felt that it should have been done. We had a unanimous feeling about that. The officers, we worked together and uh, it never happened. This false illusion about if anybody gets flooded, it will be those people in Marysville. Yuba City will never flood. And that was a false illusion that, had so, that so many people had. And uh, so we, we begin to question in our own minds about why have they not evacuated Yuba City? And this bothered all of us all of our brother officers here, and the, and the sheriff's department too. As the night went on, I can recall going up to the levee, you know where the veterans uh, park is here, at the foot of the bridge, across from where Bremers was. It. We walked up those steps and, and we were flabbergasted. We could stand on the top of the levee and just take a step over and dabble our foot in the water. And, and uh, when I did that, I, I went over to Sergeant Gaines and I said, Bob, not Bob, Sergeant, I said, can you believe this? 
believe that they haven't evacuated this city yet. And he just shook his head. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something that I've never talked about to anybody. It's something that Bob and I did that night. He, there was silence there, and, and Bob, Bob said, Jerry, I'm going to do something now. I'm your sergeant. I'm not going to make, make you come with me if you don't want to, but I'm going to do it. I'm not authorized. So I'm taking that car down there and turning that speaker on. I'm going out into the farm, farm labor camp. And he says, well, I'm going to start blasting away at those people if they should evacuate. The only thing I can think of is they, it had to break somewhere. And we were working against the people on the other side of the river because there was, the levee was completely full. It was running over the top right there at Shanghai Bend. My brother-in-law Larry and my friend Bob, we went to the, to, the emer to the disaster office and they said they didn't need us. That's kind of funny, but they said they didn't need us and you proceeded to go to Marysville. We had plenty of men for that day and the next day and that night. We had everything all arranged and we had all our men, which wasn't too much danger. In other words, in 1940, the water came just too, oh, I don't know, it's hard to explain exactly. We were just, but, uh, uh, just under, I believe, the uh, 78, wasn't it? Uh, that's after... right, and since then it had been raised about uh, seven feet, I think, seven or eight feet, the, raise, the levee was, uh, had been raised. And yet behind uh, the Chinese community, that the levee was giving way there. The riverside was where the, there was a, apparently some swirls going on and they were eating away the levee and the, the levee was leaking mm -hmm. by side and starting to shift. So you might say at that point in time a lot of us thought Marysville was going to flood. actually moving slowly and it was disintegrating. The, uh, the other side under the river had already disintegrated. So they, someone procured, I'll use the word procured, the lumber from Union Lumber. They just went and took it. And uh, we were building a support on the dry side of the levee. And we weren't getting there very fast. And we had to put those pilings pretty deep because it was so soft and mushy. And this fellow came along with a chainsaw. I'll never forget him. He was a pretty good sized guy with a hard hat on. And he says, you fellas need any help? Well, he had a chainsaw. In those days, there weren't many around. And he quickly cut that timber and we stopped, we managed to stabilize the levee with the timber and then throw some more sandbags and got it all stable. Everybody's happy, everybody's jumping up and down and laughing and you know, doing high, didn't do high fives and then but you slap each other in the back. And, and uh, then we're just finally resting a little. We didn't have much time to rest and uh, the word came down that we ne they needed us at the D Street Bridge. Then, what I don't think anybody expected, the asphalt in front of the bridge approach exploded. The pavement rose up between our feet about a foot and a column of water shot out 20 to 30 feet down D Street. People were trying to stop the water from coming up. And if you ever think about taking a 60 pound sandbag and throwing an old faithful, it's gonna go straight up in the air. And that's what happened. So. Some officer, it was either an officer from Beale Air Force Base or it might have been a city official, started yelling about a, someone get a tarp. Now, believe it or not, they got this huge tarp and they threw the, put the tarp over the, over the hole in the asphalt. By then, the Tower Theater was starting to flood. That's how much water was coming out. And everybody stood on it. Finally got the sandbags all around the tarp. The, the idea was to raise that up high enough where it neutralized with the water that was in the river, and that's what we did. But about two-thirds of the way, completing that, that circular levee around that, that hole in the asphalt, the sandbag started to shift in the pressure, and I felt it move. I let the, they started shuddering, and then I felt it move, and I thought, uh-oh. There was a lot of choice words said that night. I won't repeat them on a video, but people were shook up. And finally, someone said, it's going to go. She screamed it. Get out, get out. So everybody started screaming and hollering, and everybody running this way and that way. Oh, 
they did break. They started to run, and uh, I, I raised my voice. Unfortunately, we're not able to use the exact wordage uh, that uh, Captain George Ferry used at that particular time. That thing, the ship starting to go, was making noise. The river was making noise. Anyway, someone screamed at the... It stopped. So everybody come back. And then, then one of the policemen started blowing a whistle. Police whistle. Blowing it. One started honking a horn. And we turn around. Come on back. Come on back. It stopped. We went back and finished the job. There was Navy personnel there. There was one Navy guy, and he was on in the reserve program in Yuba City, and he had a walkie-talkie. And he's talking to several points, including Shanghai Bend. And I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I got him right now. Uh, and he said, I just got I just got a call from Shanghai Bend, so-and-so, the guy's name was older, said the levee just broke at Shanghai Bend, and oh my God. So. They started running around yelling at everybody, who lives in Yuba City, who lives in Yuba City? And he's just, these people just running around yelling, and everybody raised their hands. I raised my hand, my brother-in-law, by that time Bob had come up, and, and uh, he raised his hand. We had about, I don't know, 30 or 40 people there that lived in Yuba City. And he said, get out of here. Get out of here and get home. It's 11.30 or something. Things were pretty well stable there, so my dad and this friend of ours, we walked further north just to see what the rest of the levee looked like. And we'd gone maybe two or 300 yards and we met three or four people saying there was a hole in the levee. It was about three feet wide. Do you think if we all run down there, why we could stop it, plug the hole? Well, there was nothing but a levee to put on it. <laughs> and so we just kind of looked at each other for about a minute or so and then Everybody just turned around and started running back for the to the truck. And I think that's the first time I ever, and the only time I ever saw my dad run. We found the pickup at the bottom of the hill, the one, the levee, the one we came in. And we uh, jumped in the back of that. The driver was there too, so he had people in the front. and So he started driving out of there. And, we had there people run along behind it, and we were pulling people over the tailgate all the way out. The it was a good sizable crew, 150, 200 men maybe working down there. Never did see the whole crew, but they were dropping sand, and everybody was dragging sandbags and up and down the levee. And I saw 100 yards or two of that, and uh, uh, most of it, the water was on the second tier of sandbags over and above the top of the levee. And, uh, Bob Belay took a crew and went north from where the dump trucks were, and I stayed there. And after half an hour or so, I sent a messenger down calling my name. And uh, I said, See if you can get a few men together and, and come up to where they were. They have problems and come up the levee. So I gathered up the 25, 30 men and headed up to where Bob was and got up part way and met them coming back. And uh, they were, Bob was exhausted, so he told me that, that there was a Navy Reserve radio man there at the, uh, where the dump trucks were dumping. And he says, uh, run down. I was young and frisky and could run. And so he said, take a message to the radio man to order the immediate evacuation of Yuba City and to ban the levy. The levy has broken. I was on the telephone talking to the Navy man, and he said, tell people to get out, get out. It's flooded, we're flooded, we're flooded. And so I, I yelled to Don Taylor, who was on the air, and I said, tell people there to get out, to get away because Yuba City is flooded. And, and I found out then that my dad and my uncle uh, were down at Shanghai Bend filling sandbags working on the levee. And uh, I guess it was about half hour later and Pop came running in and he said, let's get the hell out of here. And, and uh, everybody scattered in the action. Everybody started abandoning Yuba City. 
<laughs> young and foolish, I had my little Jeep right there, and everybody took off in the dump trucks and on foot in any way they could. And I got in the little Jeep with two other men and drove up the levee, which was clear men then, so we drove right up south of the levee, levee break and uh, got out of the Jeep and actually foolishly got out of the Jeep and looked at the break. It was maybe 30 feet wide, booming through the levee. And about that time, there was a look down the right in front of our toes. There was about a two inch crack opening up in the levee. <laughs> so let's get out of here, <laughs> which we did. And headed back down and the remnants of the crew, as far as I know, everybody piled on the Jeep. Probably 15 men just hanging on it any way they could hang on. And, went out to Garden Highway where we started getting a load of people there and also up the gum tree at Lincoln Road. And between the road there, Shanghai Bend, and, and uh, the gum tree, I met the undersheriff's car going south with the red light siren. And uh, it was, I understood later that he stopped between there and where the water hit him that he stopped and talked to somebody in a pickup that was going north, the same as I was. And so, but they you know, obviously got hit by the wall of water, and so I was one of the last people to see them, that vehicle off with them alive. Sox Single Rock came down and woke us up and told us that the levee had broken. And my grandfather says, well, the water will never get out here. It didn't get out here in 32. It didn't get out here any other time, so we're not moving. Well, then about another 15 minutes later, Sox came back down to the house. They were evacuating, and they told my grandfather, you better get out, Gordon, or you're going to be sorry. We started down Hutchison, and we ended up with Gertrude Haynes, Norma Bartlett, and her husband, Robert Bartlett, which was in another car behind us. I think my grandmother's driving scared me more than anything. They had just bought a brand new 55 dog, floorboarded to probably 120 miles an hour because she was trying to outrun the water. When we tried to go up the, the road there to the Sutter Bypass, the gates were all locked, so we had no way to get up on the bypass. So all four cars backed down and we started down Township. And we got, it was before Bogue Road, and when the water hit us, and it picked our car up and slammed us up against a telephone post. And uh, we got about a mile above the Berry substation, and the road was just perfectly dry, and all of a sudden this wall of water about four feet high hit me and uh, drowned the car out, and I realized immediately that I had to get out of the car because I had my little boy that was two years old and he was sitting in the seat and the water was almost over his head at that time and I jumped out and somehow I don't know how I got on top of the car but I got him and got on top of the car. She says Gordon get out of the roll the window down and get out of the car and he says well why and she says because I'm sitting in water. So he got up on the top of the car, then he helped her, and then I came up into the front seat and he helped me up on top of the car. The car was completely submerged. Uh, my grandfather set up more on the higher part of the car and put his feet down on the 
uh, from he sat on the roof and put his feet down on the on the hood. Uh, I held on to the telephone post and so did my grandmother, because he was holding on to the window, and uh, and of course every time there'd be a something floating toward us, we'd have you know we'd get hit by it or and and luckily we were both able to hold on. I mean, it was either that or we knew we'd drowned. We had no nowhere else to go. So there was a couple times I sat down, and when I did, the water went up over the top of my head. So most of it was standing, both of us, because she's not much taller than I was. And we could hear Gertrude Haynes behind us. She had a flashlight and yelled to make sure that we were okay, and she yelled at her daughter behind her, which was Norma Bartlett, and I would say by this time it was probably two o'clock in the morning. I'm just kind of guessing the times. And approximately a couple hours after we were there, we heard Norma start screaming that Bob had drowned. I heard Bob holler, and I said, don't come to me because you can't get through. The water's too swift. Well, by the time I got the baby wrapped in a blanket, the water was almost to the top of the car, and I realized that it was going to go over the top of the car, and I had to do something to stay on top. So I reached down and opened the little wing window and put my foot in there and braced my foot so that I would at least have some chance of staying on top of the car. And then I looked around to see what had happened to the rest of the family behind me. And the lights of the car that Bob was driving, the car had drifted around so that the lights were on him. And the water was to his neck then. And he was hollering, but the water was so swift that you couldn't hear. And I kept hollering, don't waste your strength because I can't hear you. Well, about that time, the water went over the lights of the car and that was the last time I saw him. And Bob had tried to swim to her, and the current was so strong that it took him under. And uh, he actually floated up between Gertrude's car and our car. Of course, and by that time, the, the moon was really bright. It was unbelievable that the, the sky had cleared up. It was, I'm guessing, after lunch, I'm guessing between 1 and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, was when we uh, saw the helicopter. She said she had been sitting at the table, the electricity had gone off, and my aunt had a, one of the little oil lamps. And she had lit that, and they had a, a butane stove. So she had made coffee, and she put the kids to bed. And she was sitting at the kitchen table, and she said all of a sudden she felt something strange around her ankles. And she looked down, and it was water. So the bedroom was just a few feet from where she was sitting and where the kids were at. So she got up, and by the time she got in the bedroom, the water was around her knees. My mother was four foot eleven, not very tall, and when she was young, she had drowned. And they had, those days, you know, they rolled her across a log, is what she said, and, but she was petrified of water. Now here she is with a baby, new baby, and, you know, three little kids. And um, my brother was 12. And my mom said when she, she left, said she doesn't know why she did it, but she grabbed a can of milk and a box of cereal. Bed, and my aunt had cedar chests, and she, they emptied out the cedar chest and put the kids in the cedar chest, and was so the, because the water kept raising. And my brother had a little pin knife, and he was trying to hack a hole in the ceiling, but he kept hitting two befores. He couldn't make a hole. Well, my uncle had built on a room 
just down the hallway by the garage, another bedroom, he hadn't sealed it all up. There was a hole in the ceiling. So they got in there and my mom got the kids up into the ceiling and she went to get my baby brother and uh, she said the water, the cedar chest had leaked and the water was just around his little face. Said he was just laying there, not saying a word. <laughs> but anyway, she got all the kids up in the ceiling and she said they no more got settled in. My aunt had, she quilted, and she had a lot of quilting pieces up there, so they used those. She said they no more got up in the ceiling than the house went. The force of the water hit, shoved it on top of my uncle's car up into the peach orchard. And she and my mom said she could hear people screaming. So they stayed up there all day, well, all night, uh, Christmas Eve. And I think they were rescued around noon on Christmas Day. They uh, had pushed out the end of the gable of the house and was waving some of the quilting pieces to attract attention when they heard planes were going over. The, one of the things was that wall of water that come across Garden Highway. Come across was like a breaker at the ocean. And I didn't see it personally, I just missed it. But uh, I analyzed how that happened and my theory is that this maybe flaked off a little at a time until it filled that lower area between the levee and Garden Highway. And then a big section of the levee flaked off. And that's what then could go out across the top of the water that was already there and, and hit Garden Highway, kill people. Well, Bob, uh, how about the the men when they left the levee down there after the break had occurred? You said that they uh, broke and ran. Uh, what was your uh, what were your thoughts when you actually saw the ground uh, drop uh, like that and the water start coming over the top? Well, of it? Uh, I just like everybody else, I didn't think it was going to be quite as bad as it was. In other words, you take any levee, the water just the other break gets wider and wider and wider and wider, and your water just sort of seeps through, huh? comes out and. You know, they did. I didn't think there would ever in the world be the extent of damage that we did have. Well, it was. But what I think, hmm? well, what I think actually happened, it's a sand levee, and as it washed away and washed away, I think about a thousand feet of that must have fallen over all at one time, is what brought that big wave of water. Uh, fell off into the water side, do you mean? No, it fell out of, off onto the land side. I see. In other words, as it broke, then there was a cutting action there and just ate this sand away, and there was a sheer bank. We went back the next morning, and there was a sheer bank for, oh, about 4,000 feet. And I think what happened, this sand just washed in, and when it, when it got over half, in other words, when it ate out about half of the levee or more, then this whole bunch, of, a lot of this sand just flopped over, and that brought this big wave of water into Yuba City. I per that's my own personal mm -hmm. thinking, and I think that's actually what happened. I see. The water got so swift after the levee broke that it just undermined the, the piers. And that's when I think the bridge just tumbled and went out. Our clamshell was setting on the, the span that went out. My dad was still an early riser. He went over to the neighbors, the Mogenheimers, and they told my dad that the river had broke and they were driving their cows to the Sutter Bypass, that we better get out. So he come back and woke me up. I was probably one of the last people in Sutter County to wake up because our place was still no water in it. And we got our Christmas presents, put them in the car, about a single change of clothes, I think, because we were going down to San Francisco for the for the uh, the holidays, and we headed out at the end of Everglade, which is 113. Here was the water. He saw this stuff going in front of us. So he, we had a, a 50 Packard car, big old tank, and he started pulling in there, and the car started going down, and we both. At the same time, felt this. I think this isn't right. He said no, and he stopped it and he backed it out and turned around. He said, "We can go get on the barn roof and then we can be rescued from there." On the barn roof, and I could see the water coming. It was going down toward the bypass levee and kind of making a swing, following the levee along. And about that time, this gentleman Frank Getz, who had about a hundred head of cows to the north of us. 
he and his son-in-law came driving in. And they were going to try and save their cows. And they said, Bill, can we use your horse? I said, sure. So I saddled my horse up and bridled him. And Mr. Segrist, his son-in-law, was going to ride him. He says, we're going to take him to the bypass. I said, you can't make it. He said, well, we think we can. I said, take him to the river. Now, that doesn't sound like the thing to do, go to the river when the levee just broke, but that actually was the thing to do. It turned out the, the river was probably four to five feet higher than a mile away from the river. And they run right into the water. They didn't even get halfway to the bypass. And uh, they lost all their cows but the one that was on our roof. And my horse drowned. I, I talked to Segrist after the flood. He said he got the saddle off of him and the bridle. And he barely escaped. We get out by going down Garden Highway to Sacramento Avenue and then hitting the bypass. We couldn't escape to the south because the Nicholas Bridge had washed out. And Nicholas was flooded anyway. Where are you going to go if, if it had to be in there? We got up on the levee and went to San Francisco that, for our holidays. And we were telling the family about it. The next day, some of the family wanted to come back. And we, we were, they were all betting each other how deep the water was, you know, three feet, four feet. And when we came back, my uncle had a telescope. And we put it on the house, and only the peak of the roof was out. So we knew it was probably 10 feet. A giant lake. In fact, uh, there were two houses on Everglade Road that uh, belonged to a friend of mine's father. And when the water came up and got deep, and we got some wind, and it started the wave action, they never found anything from either one of the houses. They just completely disintegrated out there in the open. When we went into our house in the boat, they were snaking out the dead animals at that time. We also had a, a Palomino horse right outside our kitchen window, dead in the water there. And Roy Rogers owned 110 acres that was on the other side of us. And we heard that he had some of his prized Palominos there. But I know there was one there in our kitchen window. There were animals, there, there were sheep, pigs, just anything you could name was there. We had chickens on our barn roof. They, they managed to survive by getting up on the barn roof. And uh, we didn't have any ground squirrels after that. It drowned one. We had some neighbors. We hadn't even met them yet. They just moved in on Wilson Road. They went up 113 to George Washington, where it comes into 113 there. And the slough, Gilsizer Slough, crosses George Washington about a half a mile or more from 113. And they made the right turn there. It was the wrong turn. And they were some of the last bodies to be found. It took their cars, oh, 75 to 100 yards out in the field. If they'd have made a left turn, they would have all survived. My dad, my mother, my cousin, Bob Payne, his wife, uh, Bernice Speckard Payne, their baby, 17-month-old baby, Bernalee, and gal from Munich, Germany that I was going to marry, Connie Brown. We left, went west, because I was trying to get across the slough. The highway is built in the bottom of the slough. And uh, I went south because Smith Road, I was going to, that's the quickest way to get over there. The, Bob and Bernice and the baby were in the front car, Connie was in the middle and I was in the back. And I stopped and told him, I said, I didn't see my folks coming. I'm going back to see what's the matter. You guys go ahead. He jumped out. Bernice took off in the car. He jumped in my car with Connie, and they went. And then they stalled. I went down, back down to Jones Road, and here I saw the folks coming. And so I went. Their car, my car stalled. I pushed them with the pickup, and the water took it and just took it right on around the, the uh, Sheridan House, which is on the southwest corner of uh, Smith and Phillips Road. And then, then the water got up, I got up on top of my pickup, and finally the water, I got swept off of it. And uh, I was going towards the slough, and I grabbed a four by four post on the porch. The other two collapsed, and 
or I'd have probably got drowned. The under sheriff, John Murphy, come in, who happened to be a longtime friend. He gave me a ride over the 10th Street Bridge. And uh, the Armstrong boys were well drillers from all of hers. They were putting in a Lone Star boat with a 40 horse motor. I asked him, told him what the story was. I knew him. Yeah, come on. We went right down uh, uh, from the bridge, right down to Pluma Street, right down Pluma Street, and uh, on out. And we got out to Franklin and and, uh, and the highway. And uh, that's when I saw my cousin. He was in a amphib army rig, and. Uh, he said, Bernice, Bernalee had drowned, so had Connor. He got picked up by helicopter before I did. And uh, uh, so we went on down. I wanted to go in the, the mustard house. And Armstrong boys wouldn't let me go in the house. They went in to see that. And my folks have been, I didn't know until the next evening that they'd got picked up by Helen. And the next day, my brother and cousin and I, we got a boat and we went looking. It was about three days or so, four days later, my brother and cousin, uh, they found the baby. My brother picked the baby up out of the, the water down the slough. And uh, it was about six or seven days before we found Connie and Bernice was a couple weeks before we found her. And uh, we should have stayed at home. I got everybody to leave. And uh, if we'd have stayed at home, they'd have got wet, but they'd have still been alive. That's bothered me all my life. Your name is uh, Frank Aceto, is that right? Yes, sir. And whereabouts do you live, Frank? I'm in 921 Jesse Avenue in the Malik Track. My family lived in Hillcrest, up on a hill um, near on Jesse Avenue. My dad woke up because he had uh, was it filling. Minutes to one, I have ulcers, and they were bothering me. That's a good good thing, I guess. And uh, they started annoying me, and I woke up five minutes to one, and I turned on the radio. Well, he turned on the radio when he got up during the night. The radio announced that it was too late that the levee had broken. And so that's when they started yelling for the rest of us to get up at that time. He got my pajamas off and just got my underwear on and that my brother came in and grabbed me. And at the time, I remember the water was already getting up to my waist in the house. And it's the mantle is up. I mean, the, the hearth is up about a foot. And I thought, well, we might, might might not get this high. And I stood on there for a second or two. And my little girl and I, Chi Chi, we stood there. And all of a sudden, a gush of water just broke up. And as I was standing there, too, the lights are on. And across the street lives Billy Rice. And there was a car parked there. And the the next gush comes in there of water on the road, picks this car up, and starts putting it on a guy wire. And I says, boy, I says, this is a lot of water. I said, we've got to get out of here. And he decided to bring us um, through the garage, and we went up. We had, like, this ladder that was connected on the side of our garage, and uh, my brother was actually carrying me up because um, my mom was carrying my younger brother, and so my oldest brother carried me and when he was he actually dropped me and I went head first into the water because it was already coming over the car by that time and my eardrum was ruptured with that break watching the water rising and I can remember watching it coming over the car and my oldest sister was screaming at that point because she, you know, and I was so small, I really didn't know what the danger was at that time. So my dad noticed that there, he had a, a gun that he had stored up there. So he kept pounding the, um, the roof of our house until he made a hole big enough for us to get through. And he kept telling us to yell 
so that because you could hear people yelling throughout the night and so um, when we got up to the roof uh, there was a helicopter that came and unlike the recent flood where it showed that the rescue people were coming down to help the people they just lowered the basket and had us get in it when my mom said that to put me in well she was planning on putting one of my older siblings in with me well they didn't wait and i was um, brought up to the helicopter by myself and she said the whole time i was leaning over and i was probably scared and i can remember looking around as they were pulling this this basket up with me in it and there was just rooftops by that time that's all you could see you couldn't see anything else except for the rooftops surrounding the air my dad said i'm not going i'm not going and like all i can remember is sirens and bullhorn saying you know evacuate evacuate my dad said we're not leaving we're not leaving just go to bed and of course i'm scared and i'm running around the house and wondering what's going on and then the police come out to our house police or sheriff come out to our house and say you've got to leave the levee's broken you only got about you know a couple hours to get out of here you need to leave no I'm not leaving you know water broke in 1800 and it never came out here we're not leaving uh, my dad woke me up about midnight and we had no electricity no phone no communication whatsoever and the traffic going by on Wilson Road is what woke my dad up. And he asked me to go with him. I was 14 at the time. And so we got, went out to Wilson Road on our drive, turned north. And we was headed up towards Yuba City. And we got to Sierra Gold Nursery, which everyone will remember where that was. And there's an elevated irrigation ditch. And when we got to that point, here's a six foot wall of water coming right at us. Yeah. So we made a U-turn, went back onto Wilson Road, got my brother Herschel Hudgens and my mom, Merle P. Hudgens, and uh, we went west on Wilson Road to Messick Road to George Washington Boulevard. We headed north on George Washington, and we went across a low spot, which is Gilsizer Slough. And at that, when we went across, it was like three or four inches of water. And my dad was in one vehicle, my mom, my her brother Herschel was in a, another vehicle, and then I was in a third vehicle. We went about a mile and a half north of Gilsizer Slough, and we ran into another wall of water, like about three foot high, coming at us. So we made another U-turn, went back to the same area. My dad started to cross Gill Sizer through the low spot. I was right behind him there, and I tried to get, get him to let me go. And uh, you know, he's a big cock, uh, he, he had to show me he could do it. And the water, the force of the water, washed him off the road. And that's my brother recalled, which I didn't, but he said it was cheap being washed down the low spot, which is like a creek and the wall of water and the sheep and everything pushed his car right off the road. And that's the last, last time we saw him. Then I got out there and I tried to find him, but you know, that was a lost cause. I got out there and, and then you're trying to holler, you know, and the damn sheep were all bellering. You couldn't, you couldn't hear nothing anyway. We went out there looking for days before we ever found him. Then when we finally found it, we cut a hole at the top and went down through in there and found him. Hmm. It was a big loss in our family to lose my two brothers. And uh, I don't think my mother, she never ever got over it. Well, these are my two brothers and my mother. This is Bill, my younger brother, and this is Arthur, my oldest brother. Some friends came by to get him to work on the levee and they gladly went down to help. And while they were down there, the levee broke. And then all of a sudden, we heard the roar of the water to the back of us and to the north. And we felt something was wrong. We didn't know what it was because we'd never been in a, 
Never been in a break before. That uh, Art said, I don't believe I can make it, or I don't think I can make it. Uh, that was that was Bill. Uh, Bill was uh, just in back of us, and uh, Art was ahead of me, and I, and I was about in the middle. And uh, Bill said, Walt, I can't quite make it. And I said, Bill, you you you've got to go. We've we've got to make this tree, and. It was just something that, with the the weight of the hip boots, uh, uh, he was just uh, too far away from that tree to 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 get there. And uh, of course, right then, Bill was drowned. And uh, when Art and I made the tree, we decided that we had to uh, get rid of all the rain gear that we possibly could to. To, to be lighter because we knew we probably had to do some swimming and uh, we felt that this tree wasn't going to stay up. And we waited and I think about... Uh, the tree stayed up about five minutes and then all of a sudden it just went down without any warning. And, uh, of course, Arthur could not swim and I believe Arthur was drowned there on the spot. And... Then I was swept away to the to the next uh, row of trees or the third row, and I believe that was my closest uh, call. I, I felt that uh, I was going down, and in fact I was I was gagging. Uh, I was more or less going down, and I might add this, Lloyd, that you don't fear death because uh, I felt well. This is it. I wanted to live for my my two children and my wife, Jean. And I wanted to live in the worst way, but I felt I was going to die, and if I died, I was going to see my mother, and I, I think I would have seen her because it was just that I was that one split second there. I was just about going down, but I lift, put my hand up, and there was a limb that held. 16-year-old and two 18-year-olds and one 65-year-old car. I had a 51 Plymouth car, two-door, and so she's in the back seat with my cousin Joan, the girl, and Orlin and I are both in the front seat, and I'm driving. And so we loaded the load of cattle, and we're leaving now. I remember making, trying to make a decision at, at uh, Oswald Road and George Washington, saying, uh, should I go left and go to Township, or should I continue north on George Washington? Well, I decided that I knew the road better, I'd go north, and uh, got up oh, probably a mile, half a mile, something, maybe a mile, and water started coming across the road, and about a three-foot wall came rushing across, and that was it. Took the car, pushed it off nose first down off the left side of the street, or highway. At that point, uh, got out and said, could we stand? And I got out, walked in the back of the car, and sure enough, we could stand up. The water was still being, it wasn't rushing, so it was uh, being broken by the trees, the orchard on the right-hand side of the highway, and therefore we could get out and, and walk. Well, my grandmother said, well, I can't walk. I said, yes, you can. We can hold you. Well, my, here's my cousin in this cast, but he had hip boots on. I think I did, too, because I don't ever remember getting my feet wet. It's amazing. The water had to be <laughs> just at thigh level. Uh, and we walked about 100 yards, and that building still stands out there on George Washington today. And so we probably walked 100 yards, and my car went off the side of the road. We held arms and got to the building. I don't know who owned it then. I don't know who owns it today, but that building had a lock on the door, but next to the door was a crowbar, just like it was there. Took the crowbar, broke the lock, we got inside, and uh, said, well, we better get up in the rafters because we don't know how high the water is going to come. Well, all during the night or the dark hours, the water continued to rise. And uh, so we knocked the hole in the roof and two of my cousin and I both got on the roof and my grandmother and, and my girl cousin Joan uh, stayed in the rafters there. And, and I remember as first break of daylight, uh, the sky was blue. Uh, it was quiet. It was just you heard was the sound of water rising and things falling over. 
the building was not moving. It was pretty good at that point. We realized that things were not causing it to go. It didn't like the water wasn't rushing by us. I look back at it now and say that I was glad that building was there. Uh, so soon thereafter, the sky filled with uh, looked like World War II uh, air uh, fights. You know, uh, airplanes everywhere flying over. Uh, assessing the damage and how much water was spilled. So we were in there and in that barn or in that shed for uh, quite a few hours and a helicopter came and I can remember my grandmother lowered the bag, uh, the seat down and going to take us out. And my grandmother said at my age I've never been and I've never flown and I'm not flying now. <laughs> so we waved him off. Uh, so we stayed and it was at one o'clock when an army duck came and there's a picture, and I remember it was in the Sacramento Bee of myself and a soldier packing my grandmother out of the building and putting her in the Army duck. And Not too long later, she woke us up and said, get up, the, the river's broken at the gum tree, which is right up at the end of Lincoln Road there. So, uh, my mom called her brothers, the Ziegemeyer boys from Sutter, and they brought all their trucks out and loaded up all our furniture. And we had this really old fancy piano from that uh, was from the Chicago World's Fair that was brought around the Cape to California and to up to the Buttes. And then I inherited that beautiful piano. So they had a hard time getting it out of the house. And, and they took off a big brick off the front steps and it's still broken off <laughs> getting the piano. But they got all the furniture out and, uh, and my sister was saddling her horse because they couldn't didn't have a trailer for the horse. And so then I saw the waters. So that's the part where I get the chills because you could just see it like waves of the ocean as it came in and just rolled over the land. And I just started, I was a young teenager, ran like crazy to the house and yelled, the water's coming. And so we jumped in the old blue Buick and mom says, everybody, my, my sister and my younger sister, my sister rode the horse out, so she says, go down Lincoln Road till you get to Humphreys. Do not go down Township. It's low. And I think some people drowned there, too, because they tried to cut over on Township. And so we were driving along, and I was sitting on the back seat watching out the window, and there's my sister coming on her horse behind us, and there comes the floodwaters. You could just see them. It, it was really scary. For about half an hour, you heard this roar, and it just kept getting louder and louder and louder. And... It just, you think, well, what's that, you know? So we were getting stuff around in the whole works, and I was standing on the porch, and I looked out, and my father back thing, and he drove that pickup in here, and, and him and Mr. Viney jumped out, and they ran for the thing, and they hit the fence, and what he did, a four foot of water rolling, not coming in, it's a rolling water, and it's about four foot high, and if the fence hadn't been there, they'd knock both of them in the water, but they hung on, and they made it into the house. And they took us up in the helicopter. Why? They circled every building, every tree, everything. We got up here to, there was this two-story house up here on the corner, and they circled it. And up comes somebody out of the top of it. They cut a hole in the roof, and it was quite a deal. We took us to Ella school over there and uh, I had on a pair of men's old bib overalls. It had been raining and of course we were milking and all and I had on a pair of old bib overalls and I had a big hole in the knee of them but they came to me and asked me if they found me something to wear if I would give that to a man who had tied himself to electric pole and it tore his clothes off of him. And that unknown of how fast and how far is it coming was was uh, that was, uh, I never shook so much in my, <laughs> my life as I did that night. I swear my backbone and my skin separated just from shaking, so being so afraid. That, but, uh, you know, I've told the story that we're out there and we survived, and seven of our neighbors that night, we know, within a mile of our house, uh, did not survive. Our church never came back then. Methodist Church at O'Banion Corners. It basically, that was the end of that church. Uh, that little segment of history of 
once was the old Banyan Corners had the blacksmith shop, the store, the school, and the church, and today there's zero. So different things eliminated different things. The flood kind of took the last part of that piece of history. I can still picture, I can still picture different things. Uh, like say the barns, the disaster, all the orchards. I mean, it's just, there was trash everywhere. I mean, there, it just wasn't one spot. Everywhere you look, there's clothes and, and items hanging in trees and, and, and dead animals that, that, that floated in this flood. So it, it, it you know, you still remember it, really do. And, uh, you know, a lot of changes in the town, but at that time, you know, down Plum Street later on, it was just devastating after the flood. You go down there and everything had been flooded out and houses. The further you went south, the worse it got. We would drive down Pluma Street. When we went through, we were able to drive down Pluma Street and we saw how high the water is at a theater and, and a few landmarks like that. Everything was pretty gunky looking. It was covered with this slimy looking mud that just stuck to everything. Uh, we got home and just getting out of the car was an adventure because we got mud all over us just getting out of the car. It just, our tires had picked it up and thrown it on there. It just stuck. I remember that it was real fine, fine grain mud and it just stuck to everything. And it stunk. Oh my God, it stunk. The, it, the only time I had anything worse was when I landed in Vietnam and opened the door to, and, and the airplane door opened and we walked out into the air there. That was about the closest I've ever come to the stink that was in Yuba City at that. There was a, never will forget, there was a kind of a, an apartment, long building was along there. And that thing was in the middle of the Percy, of uh, Garden Highway. It floated it up and set it down in the middle of the road. And you had to drive around it to get, to get around it. There was a horse that was trapped standing vertically on a prune tree with wrapped it with wrapped up with wire that got it got was trying to swim and got into fence wire and stuff you know because it was floating all over the place and just got trapped and it just it died right there and it, hanging onto that tree and in that wrapped with wire and around that tree you know 50 gallon barrels of oil they'll float because their oil's lighter than water and they float Pro, uh, t propane tanks float uh, fuel tanks will roll over and all the fuel runs out of them. I mean, all of that stuff was just contaminated everything you could get, you know, and then they, when they cut, cut the hole in the levee down at Dingville, finally, you know, the, the, the water kind of subsided and went out through that and it, everything disappears, you know. House traders float. On that levee, the, all the way along there, there was water on both sides. The bypass was full and the, the dry side was the Sutter County. There was animals, there was chickens, there was dogs, there was rabbits, you name it. And it was on that thing. And the animals were just running back and forth. I don't know how long they stayed there. They were they were there when we went down. And I, I'll tell you the story that there was two big German police dogs and they were chasing rabbits. They had run one way and a rabbit would run past them and they'd turn around and run the other way. When we came back, it had to be two hours, two and a half hours later, those dogs were so tired that they couldn't move. This rabbit coming along and ran into one of them and just flipped over the top of him. And he, all he could do was pick up his head and look at him. He didn't have the energy to get up to move or anything else. The trees, the trees were full of pheasants and chickens. You know, and it was high ground. That was, they had chased them out of every other place they could chase them out. After the water started going down, they sent me out somewhere out in south of Yuba City in a big field out there. And they'd taken dozers and cut big trenches. And then they were hauling cattle in there that had died and we were burying them with the truck train, lifting them and setting them in the hole and bury them. I worked there three or four days. My vivid memory is all the trees being knocked over and the swiftness of the, you know, the river going through and the house being off its foundation and just mud and soot and just everything you can think of, dead animals, whatever, all around. Going back to the house after it was all cleaned up and we moved back in, you could still smell the mustiness from the, even though they put new 
cut the wall up four feet where the water was and put, I don't know what you call that, plaster stuff. We knew all that, but still the smell was there. It was there for as long as I can remember. He was, because being an immigrant, you know, he worked on the railroads and worked for nothing, you know, and saved his money to buy his ranch, and that meant the world to him. So, <laughs> I get really teary-eyed. We live very frugally, and to rebuild, really not having much, and then have it all gone, and then try to rebuild on that, which, you know, we did, and we, and he succeeded. The flood, it's something that will always stay with me because now with all these floods that are happening around us now, like Katrina and so forth, it really touches my heart to see, I'm gonna start crying, <laughs> the feelings that people have to go through. Remember that after the flood, I never seen my father at the house. I wanted to see him, I went to the barn, or went to the field. He was determined that it was going to be redone. And that's really what I believe it killed him. It was blew his heart out trying to rebuild. And I was so small that I didn't realize really the massive of the damage done in the whole works. I realized that it destroyed our family because we were doing fairly good. And all of a sudden we're back to scrounging for, and uh, uh, money was real tight. So on a Sunday, we got hold of a boat, and we hauled it to Queens Avenue. The water was fairly shallow there. We walked it into the deep water, went up Pluma Street, up Percy Avenue to my house, and all I could see was 10 inches of the gable sticking out of the water. And, uh, we were just married four years, and the bad part about it, we had just paid off all of our furniture off in July and August of that year. So we just walked out with our clothes on, in my car, that was it. We had to start from scratch. Now I'll tell you, now I, was, I was in the working two jobs, Saturdays, Sundays, and report to her, her cousin got a ranch up in Gridley. He did uh, uh, fruit trees and ground. And uh, I'd go up there and jump on a cat at 6 o'clock at night and worked till 9 o'clock at night. Come home, get up the next morning, run a crew. I was working to set it up. I was working right until 8, 5 o'clock, come home, have a quick break. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, I was putting 14 hours a day on Saturdays and Sundays to make our ends meet try to get back on our feet again. And we didn't get our, then we moved in 64 to Morton Street where we live now and we were two years, over two years, before we could get enough to afford to buy furniture for our, for our living room. Because we had all this other stuff. I still had no idea that it would cause the damage that it did, the destruction or the fear that eventually comes. My fear didn't set in until I got caught in the water, and that was fear. But we can go back to Yuba City, the Sutter County town on the Feather River that was evacuated Christmas Eve. Go back days later with the families returning and watch the process of restoration begin. First, was your house one of the 450 in that county alone that was completely destroyed, or one of the 5,700 damaged? Do you have resources to meet your needs? Can you reestablish a small one-family business? Or do you need tools, supplies, stock necessary to resume earning your living? Can you rebuild and refurnish your home? Or do you need help? The answers to these questions are the responsibility you've entrusted to your American Red Cross while the repair and rebuilding of roads, bridges, and other public facilities rests with government agencies.
Just let me live between four walls where I cannot be harmed, and press your fingers to the glass, but never press too Grab the children, get to higher ground. 